Hello everyone, my name is Curry Stegan, and I am the host of the Passion for the Paranormal podcast show. Thank you for tuning into the show on my YouTube channel, and please make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can check out other great content that's going to be coming down the road. Todd C's case has become a mystery wrapped in an enigma. The 39-year-old Todd C's of Northumberland, Pennsylvania, headed out from his house on the 4th of August 2002 in the early morning hours around 5 a.m. on his four-wheel ATV to spot deer. After several hours had passed and he failed to return home, the family called the police. Later that afternoon, a search party set out to look for him. For over a day, the large search party combed the wooded area in and around his 80-acre property. They also used cadaver and search dogs trying to locate him. After an exhaustive search, around 7 p.m. the next day, his body was finally discovered about 25 yards from the back door of his house in a brush area where he was lying under a dead tree. There have also been reports of UFOs seen in the area and unconfirmed sightings of a UFO flying low early that morning around the time he went out. It is hard to imagine how a large search party had traversed this area several times before with search dogs and never found his body. The coroner stated that Mr. Cease had been deceased for about 30 hours before his body was discovered, which raised other questions. About seven and a half weeks later, a cause of death was determined to be a drug overdose, despite there never being any past suspicion of drug use or trouble with the law. Law enforcement officials, the coroner, search party members, and others have been mostly silent when questioned about the case. In addition, law enforcement officials have also said they cannot answer questions about his death, stating that the case is still open cause of death being determined to be a drug overdose, how is it that the case is still open? Was this an alien abduction gone bad or some other mysterious circumstance? This is the case of the mysterious death of Todd Sees, along with Butch Witkowski and his research team, who have spent over nine years trying to search out the truth of what really transpired on that dreadful day. The opinions and views expressed by the guests of Passion for the Paranormal are not always the views and opinions expressed by the host. Well, hello out there and welcome once again to Passion for the Paranormal, bringing a passion for the paranormal to you. I'm your host, Curry Stegan, and it's so great to be back with you once again. And tonight I've got Butch Witkowski joining me on the show. And uh, Butch is the director of the UFO Research Center of Pennsylvania. And he is also a former MUFON field investigator. And Butch and his research team have been looking into the mysterious Todd C's case for a number of years now, trying to get to the bottom of it and trying to get some answers. You know, there's a lot of speculation out there as to whether this may have been an alien abduction gone bad. Uh, but per- perhaps it's something else. And so it's going to be really interesting to pick his brain and see where they're at with the case and whether there's any new developments. It is such a bizarre case and and uh, should really be a great show tonight. If you haven't already, please head over to the Facebook page at facebook.com slash passion, the number four, the paranormal, and please like and follow us there. And uh, if you're an iTunes user, please uh, just spend a minute to uh, offer a quick review there. And uh, that's really going to help us help others find the show. And uh, it's so important to me that uh, anybody who's willing to go on and offer a quick one-minute review, I'm going to send you a $25 Amazon gift card in the mail. So that's all you got to do is message me. You can send me an email at passion, the number four, 
theparanormal at gmail.com, or you can message me on the Facebook page and let me know that you've done the review if you're the first one to do so. I will kindly mail you a $25 Amazon gift card out in the mail. It's all for just a minute of your time to do a quick review on the show. And uh, I wanted to share... Uh, a review that I just had done, the most recent review uh, done by Sweaty Startup, and the review says, uh, pretty neat show. Curry is well-spoken and the content is well thought out. And so I really appreciate that uh, that review. That was a five-star review. And uh, I have a few others there on the iTunes page, but uh, so important to get those reviews and uh, help others to, to find the show. And it really also offers proof of the show. So if you're a Google Play user and you're tuning into the show there, you can subscribe to the to the show there. So uh, please do that if you're tuning in through Google Play. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, I did a Facebook poll, another Facebook poll I ran. And uh, the question that I did on the poll was, have you ever saw a UFO or a flying object you believe was not of this world? And so on this question, uh, there were 108 people who voted, and uh, 57 out of 108 voted yes that they have saw a UFO or something they believed in the something in the sky they believed was not of this world. So that's 53 uh, percent, pretty high, a little bit higher than I would expect it to have, to have been. Um, and thank you to everybody who participated in that bo- that that uh, poll. I really appreciate that. And uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get into discussion with Butch. One thing I want to mention is uh, before I do that is uh, if you have anybody you know who you think would enjoy the show and you've been tuning in, please uh, share the link with them and let them know about the show. Um, We are up against uh, a lot of shows out there that are on radio networks that have large advertising budgets. And so we really rely on word of mouth and for others to go to, uh, you know, share the show. So uh, please do that. Share it with a friend if you've really been enjoying the show and tuning in. All right. So uh, once again, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get into the discussion with Butch. And uh, I hope you really enjoy tonight's show. All right. So my guest tonight is Butch Witkowski. And Butch is the founder and director of the UFO Research Center of Pennsylvania He is also the editor of the Journal of Abnormal Abduction Research, a former MUFON chief investigator and former law enforcement officer. Butch, thank you so much for uh, joining me on the show tonight. It's great to have you. Uh, Pleasure to be asked. (laughs) Come on and talk to you. Yeah, and you know, I've I've, uh, read quite a bit about the case over the past year, so I think I became familiar with it. We're we're really going to be talking, you know, primarily about the Todd C's case, the mysterious Todd C's case, and uh, I've read some things about the case, and uh, wow, what a bizarre case this is, just absolutely bizarre. I can't even hardly wrap my my, uh, brain around this. Yep, and it's still under investigation. We, we're still learning new things about it every, pretty much every day. Right, and that's the interesting thing is uh, it seems like there's so many, so many um, different ways you could go on this case. But before we get into that kind of discussion, can you kind of take us back to uh, August of 2002 and just kind of give us a, a quick rundown of what occurred on that day? Sure. Uh, well... I had actually spoken, I was speaking at a conference, and I was talking about human mutilations and cattle mutilations, and somebody had sent me uh, a copy of a report from the National UFO Reporting Center, uh, a case brief on uh, Todd Thies' case, abduction by aliens, etc. And um, so I, I printed it, read it. And it just, the whole thing was just not right. It just, it just didn't register. First of all, the case brief was printed on August 24th of 2002, but the contacts and the report itself, uh, only came out on August 28th, 2002. So it was, there's a four day difference there. And then when I read the report and started pulling up information, the report basically copied, or, you know, everything that was said and described in the local newspaper, uh, the Northumberland Daily Item, 
And um, it, it, the whole thing just didn't make any sense. So we left it go for a little bit and then uh, dug up a little bit more information on it. And um, it started to make even less sense. I mean, the way it was described that this fault took place. Um, Todd Cease was last seen alive on 8-4-02 at um, 1 o'clock in the morning. And uh, his normal routine uh, during hunting season was to leave his house at about 5 o'clock in the morning, and he's usually back by noon. Well, on this particular day, August uh, the 4th, he left his regular time and everything, and then he uh, never showed up. And family started looking to looking for him, but they couldn't find him. Uh, he lives on a very large property, very hilly, rocky property. And he uh, was not found in any of his normal locations by the family. Uh, they called the police. A, uh, a very large search party uh, was assembled. Over 200 people, fire departments, police departments, state police departments, uh, cadaver dogs, guys on ATVs, uh, the whole nine yards. I mean, they were out uh, really all over that mountain. The ATV was found that he was on. No struggle around the ATV. Uh, keys were in the ignition, had gas. They never did find the keys, but they didn't find him either. And he was found the next day, uh, a little after 7 p.m., on his property, approximately 50 yards from his house, under a tree, and he was dead. That really struck the chord because the only access to the back of the property was a road that, uh, a one lane road that leads along off the highway up to their driveway and then up into the wooded area. So nobody could understand how all these researchers, uh, you know, searching all over the place, this guy, cadaver dogs, guys on horseback, helicopters, whole nine yards. We're walking past this body. So we tried to get a hold of the police department. They didn't want to talk to us. Family didn't want to talk to us. And um, we finally contacted the coroner. He ran us around the bush, wanting us to donate to some kind of fund that he started for some children's organization. He kept avoiding the question because we wanted to get a copy of the autopsy report. And then when we obtained a copy of the report about a month later from him on his letterhead and the complete report, the case just went crazy because the, the state of the body, the state that the body was in was an advanced putrefaction. Now, all these researchers 50 yards from the house, walking up and down, driving around, walking all over the property, missed this guy. The dogs don't smell him. Uh, nothing. It's just nothing. They find nothing. And yet he's in plain sight, laying under a tree. Uh, the autopsy shows that he was, uh, his demise was caused by a cocaine overdose, which when we got the report and looked at the amount of cocaine, cocaine over uh, cocaine in his system, the degraded cocaine, uh, this guy, couldn't have taken two or three steps, he would have fell over dead. Yet, he walked a mile away from where the ATV was without shoes over this rocky terrain and winds up under a tree in his own property. Yet, he has no, uh, his, his socks are muddy, but there's no cuts or abrasions or, you know, any damage to his feet. We were on site at that house and walking around in hiking boots. Those rocks up there were just about piercing the bottom of the soles of your shoes. So how he got from point A, the ATV, to point B under a tree at his house was just another piece of the mystery. So we decided back in 2000, late 2008, early 2009, to really take on the case and really go after it. And um, I guess the one that hit me the most was an email that I received in 2010 from uh, a uh, person that lives up in that area. 
and uh, her email stated that people were saying he was severely mutilated. Well, that turned out not to be true. But one of the lines in her email was that, and I quote, I live 10 miles from where Todd Cease was murdered. So now it's turned into a full-blown investigation, as you can imagine. Uh, nobody would talk to us. Police wouldn't talk to us. Fire department wouldn't talk to us. Rescue met personnel wouldn't talk to us. Nobody. The coroner, after he realized that he gave us the whole report, he didn't talk to us anymore either. And um, I guess the fact that when we started looking into Todd himself, we found no information on this guy. He drove a bread truck for a living. Um, we found no driver's license. We found no social security number, which we did later, but at that time we did not. Uh, no information on him whatsoever, military record. Uh, we did find an arrest record of a parking, of a, um, a moving violation where he did 35 mile an hour in a 25 zone. He paid it. That was it. That was it. It, it just seemed like he didn't exist. We talked to, uh, people that knew him. Uh, nobody believed he died of a cocaine overdose. Uh, he was involved with the Little League up in Northampton, Northumberland County. Uh, the guy was really beloved by everybody. And like one of the guys from the little league said, Hey, if we even knew that this guy had anything to do with drugs, we weren't going to put him anywhere near these kids. Uh, his monument at the cemetery, uh, is inscribed with, you know, uh, stuff from the little league, uh, football, deer hunting. Uh, we couldn't find anything that would denote this guy as a drug user. Checked with all the police departments, state departments, uh, uh, Bureau of Narcotics from the, from the state of Pennsylvania. They had nothing on him. Uh, talked to state troopers in the area uh, that worked narcotics. They said, we know every scumbag in the area, and he's not one of them. Never heard of him. Um, it was like chasing a ghost around in a closet. You know what I mean? Nothing was there. There was no there. Uh, there was no, nobody didn't, we couldn't find anybody didn't like this guy. He's a member of the fire company, uh, civic organizations. It, it was just, everything was wrong about the case. Uh, especially the amount of degraded cocaine in his system. That amount of degraded cocaine, like I said before, he, he probably would have taken three to five steps and fell over dead. Yet he miraculously goes from his ATV one mile from his house and dies or collapses dead on his uh, own lawn, so to speak. The coroner said he's, he's been dead for 36 to 40 hours. So now I'm thinking that I got the first documented case of a real zombie. <laughs> but it all turns out that this... Nobody's talking. The family didn't talk. Um, we couldn't find any pictures of the guy. Uh, when I went into the Social Security death record, which I checked my father just to see how it worked, uh, everything was in there. My dad's name, address, phone number, where he worked, how many kids he had, who we were, where we lived. I mean, there was everything there. When he died, uh, I put him in, and it had a date of birth, a date of death, he was married, had children, that was not there. And the rest of the page was blank. And at the very bottom of that page, it said, uh, no further information available. We will be right back after this brief message. Bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar, the creator and host of Weird Darkness, bringing you true stories of the paranormal, supernatural, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. New episodes seven days a week. Get the podcast at WeirdDarkness.com or search for Weird Darkness in your favorite podcast app. Now, you could go into your own family's background and put in somebody that you knew that's been dead in your family in the Social Security Index, and you'll get all that information. I tried it with four or five different people. It all comes up the same. With him, it was a blank. We did get a hold of his social security number, quite accidentally, 
to one of our researchers, uh, did a de genealogy study, and the day she got that, the day after that, it was missing. The page was shut down. So it just seemed like every time we went to find something out regarding Todd, it either disappeared or it wasn't there to begin with. And um, the fact that cadaver dogs, and I worked with them many years ago, they could find a body under six feet of dirt. This thing, this, this guy was laying out on his lawn under a broken down tree, and they had to walk between 50 yards from the house, but from the road to the tree, the broke tree, it's only like 20 yards. This guy was in the advanced stages of decomposition so bad that there was no way there was going to be an open casket. That brought up another problem. How did this body decompose in 36 hours? Right. To the point where it was, he was pretty much unrecognizable. That that is just so bizarre um, that uh, one the police have been so unwilling to answer any questions, and uh, just really anybody involved with the case has have just been unwilling to talk. Uh, and I think the other interesting thing that uh, to me the most interesting thing is uh, for for a while there there was no cause of death and then wasn't it like seven and a half weeks later by the time they determined the cause of death right yes yeah okay and and um so they they said you know toxic toxicity reports ruled it as cocaine overdose mm -hmm. it, it's it's just such a bizarre thing because like you said this guy seems to be pretty squeaky clean it just it just doesn't add up somebody would have said something somebody would have said yes he had a problem he he you know he he had had a drug we problem. checked with the local drug agencies you know where people go to get cleaned up they had no record of him uh all the police departments in the area had no record of him and when it came to finding anything related to uh, uh drugs and toxicity there was zero nothing absolutely nothing we talked to some friends of his who said, no, no way did this guy ever do drugs. They never even saw him really smoke a cigarette. I mean, this guy was squeaky clean as far as a background. And um, the family, I mean, we were only ever contacted by one member of the family. And uh, I guess she heard that I was going to give a conference. Uh, and his name was going to be brought up, but that was very early on in the in the uh, investigation. And the original report that I picked up on from the National UFO Reporting Center, well, of course they were saying that it was a um, an alien abduction gone bad. Well, no evidence of that either. So we have uh, a guy that's in an area, and this area is so remote; it's just unbelievable. If you want to kill somebody in that area, you and it's it's one of the biggest uh, areas where it's just loaded with snakes, rattlesnakes. They they hold their rattlesnake round up there every year. So somebody going up there and shooting somebody at three o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning wouldn't even be paid any attention to. And it's that that terrain is so rugged that you could walk up and just bash somebody's brains in and walk out, get in your car and drive off, and nobody would ever know who did it. So another thing then pops up a little later in the investigation where the same family member contacts, contacts us and says, we were out looking for the keys, but we did find his camouflage coveralls. And we went through all the pockets and the keys weren't there. There was nothing in the pockets whatsoever. Lo and behold, they turn it over to the local police department and they turn it over to the state police, which are actually con containing the uh, report and the investigation. And they say that there was cocaine found in the pocket. So we got back to family and said, wait a minute, you told us that you turned over the coveralls, which you were looking for the keys to the ATV, but you didn't find them, but there was nothing in the coveralls. And they said, yeah, that's right. And I said, well, I'm looking at a report here. It says that they found cocaine, the police found cocaine in the coveralls. 
in the pocket. And they flipped out and said, that's a lie. Okay, so now it's time to go talk to the police, right? So we go up there, make an appointment to see them. Uh, we're sitting in the parking lot like a bunch of dummies. They don't show up. Go inside, talk to the secretary, uh, where are the police at, they're supposed to meet us here, blah, 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 blah. Well, they're on patrol, but they'll be back shortly. Well, they're on patrol. Wait a minute. They only have three cops for the whole town. So whoever was on patrol was not coming back to see us. So the girl says, well, they should be, he should be back in for lunch. Well, we wait around past lunch till 2 o'clock, no show, go back in. What's the story? Well, he went home for the day. Uh, his time is up. He'll have to come back another day. So wow. they blew us off. So we go to the local fire company, which played a big part in the uh, search effort, and, uh, one of the three. And we called, there's nobody at the firehouse, but we called the number uh, on the door for emergencies and non-emergencies. And we want a copy of the um, incident report for the day before, the day of, and the day after this case starts. They hang up on us. So we call back, and the line is disconnected. So whatever happened up there, as far as investigators go, uh, asking questions, you get shut down at every turn. So everything that you gather, you gather on your own. You know, for the body to get from point A to point B, when theoretically he should already be dead, and for this, the body to be in that state, that condition of putrefaction in that short a period of time, which one family member said to us, well, it did rain that day, so that might have been why the dogs didn't smell him. Well, we checked into that, which is very easy to do. And on that particular day, the rain count was 0, 0, 0. 0.01 inches. That's not even enough to wet the windshield of my car. Right. So the biggest questions, I guess, are, one, how did he get from the ATV to the house? One, theoretically, he should have already been dead. How did he get into that advanced stage of putrefaction in 36 hours? I mean, we're talking skin slippage, the whole nine yards. This, 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 this body was in bad shape. They could draw, they could draw no blood from the chest cavity. Now, every autopsy I've ever attended, that's where they draw blood from, the chest cavity, because it's a cavity. It holds blood, correct? Right. The only place they could draw any blood from him was his ankle area. Wow. Uh, stomach content, a greenish fluid, but we found out that he pretty much, everywhere he went, he had a can of Mountain Dew in the sink, and so probably that's what it was. But they didn't even test that. Uh, there was no damage to his nasal areas, which a co heavy cocaine user would have had. Uh, all, the, all the remarkable things that a hardcore cocaine user would have had, he had none. Barring the shape of the body, he was a perfectly healthy 39-year-old white male. Right. So uh, no broken bones. No, uh, he had a lot of contusions and bruise, bruises and scratches and scuffs, you know, from probably in the woods there. But, um, I mean, he was found in his shorts, a uh, pair of socks and T-shirt. Uh, so where did he take all? We never did find out from the family where they found the coveralls. It, it just... A whole lot of things that don't really have an answer to. So now we've been working on this thing since 2009. My little one inch binder is now a six inch binder. Uh, everything we've gotten, and we started from the very beginning with this, that everything we were going to get, we were going to get in writing on email or snail mail uh, or recorded. I, I didn't want any. Uh, statements made, um, you know, over the phone uh, or in person without any documentation. So everything we got has been documented. So then we find out uh, a couple of years ago that there was a page missing from the toxicology report, which we also got. 
And then that, that second page, it's, it mentioned test for uh, uh, illicit drugs. And the second thing it said to test for was moonshine. Now, I don't know what the hell moonshine has to do with this if the guy's got that kind of, that kind of drug in the system. But this guy did not die of an overdose of moonshine, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, the story that he was bitten by a rattlesnake and it was laying next to the body, that was false. I mean, there were so many false things about this thing that was presented out to the public that when we got a hold of the reporter that was publishing all this stuff and uh, we started questioning her, and she really didn't have any answers. She was pretty much making it up as she was going along. And um, before we even contacted her, we made sure we printed everything from the newspaper because I knew what was going to happen with that. Well, we, she pretty much blew us off, said she'd get back to us. And the next day, first thing in the morning, I went into the newspaper archives and all, all of the newspaper reports that she put out on the Tatsis case were gone. Wow. Missing. Wow, that's, that is quite strange. Um, yeah, it, it's, it, 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 it just, the whole thing is just so bizarre. And, and I know there's a, a, there's a few researchers out there say they got all the answers and they've got this, that, and the other thing. Well, I'll tell you this. I mean, they have nothing of what we have. Myself uh, and two of my investigators, which one works for the Florida Highway Patrol as an investigator, and the other one's a private detective in Florida. They came up here to Pennsylvania, and they did all the, along with us, did all the information gathering early on since 2009. Uh, we've made all the contacts. Uh, then things come out of the blue. Uh, got an email, well, that was about a year and a half ago, from a uh, Pennsylvania State Trooper um, uh, sergeant, uh, now retired, long re not now retired, and um, lives uh, down in South Carolina, I think now, or North Carolina. And he relates to us that, uh, you know, what he knows of the case. And... Um, Although I can't go into a lot of it, a lot of it really helped us out because things that we had no idea, because we were led to believe that the local police department was doing this investigation. This was their case. And uh, when we got this email from this um, uh, state police sergeant, retired, the case was theirs. They took the case immediately because the other the little three-man township police there, they didn't have the wherewithal or anything to even conduct that type of investigation, so it turned over to police, uh, state police. So uh, all the evidence taken, you know, samples from the body and evidence that they had through the police department, like the coveralls and all that stuff, all came uh, to the state police. They had it all. So we tried to get the information from the state police crime lab, and they pretty much said that, oh, that stuff has all been destroyed long already. They didn't keep it because, you know, the cause of death was given as a uh, cocaine overdose toxicity. And I said, well, what if it wasn't that? Oh, no, we're pretty sure it is. I said, well, no, you're only sure what the... the, the uh, the coroner's office said. Right. Yeah. That's another thing. And the coroner, when we asked who pronounced the body dead at the scene, he said, well, he wasn't there. It was the other coroner. Now, he said he's only the assistant coroner. Well, he lied. He is the coroner. The other guy that he said was the coroner, he beat in a runoff election two years prior. That guy was never even at the scene. So... I mean, everybody that we questioned that would have an answer pretty much lied. Wow. The police, police, the coroner, the fire department, um, you know, uh, the uh, the pathologist that took care of, that did the autopsy, the toxicology people that did the toxicity reports. I mean, everybody was lying, and it was so easy to find them, you know, to catch them in it. And then, you know, the pathologist retired 
you know, over the years, a lot of these people retired, but we made connections with the coroner to the, her assistant who was a, um, retired army, uh, medical officer in charge of, uh, autopsies and stuff like that. Early on in the case, uh, things were said that the FBI was handling the case. Well, that's not true. Uh, then they said that the body was taken to Fort Indian Town Gap for an autopsy before it went to uh, Allentown Hospital. And when it was at Fort Indian Town Gap, it was uh, the autopsy took place in a level three containment uh, building. Now, I, that I didn't understand at all. Um, I don't know why you would take a body to a level three containment uh, building for a simple autopsy. Right, unless there was something else you were I mean, worried that's about. Just ludic- that's just ludicrous. <laughs> that makes no sense whatsoever. Right, absolutely. Now, at Indian Town Gap, Fort Indian Gap, there is a, con- a le- as a matter of fact, it's a level five containment uh, building. Uh, but that was still under construction when all this took place. Right. So, so one of, well, one of, know, one of the questions I wanted to ask real fast, sorry I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I, I just think an interesting aspect of this, and I know you are trying to approach this as a as an investigator and, um, you know, as any professional investigator would and not try and um, make any assumptions and just let the evidence take you where it does. And, and I understand right. that. Um, but can you talk about, because Peter Davenport, uh, National UFO Reporting Center, he received reports from, um, now there were a couple of fishers, right, and then a farmer separately that had reported uh, seeing a, a UFO uh, in the area. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's also kind of an interesting twist on the case. Okay. Um, in that in that particular area uh, where the Todd Feast residence was, uh, on one side there is a farm. Okay, that would be on the south side. On the east side is a river. Now, the those two reports of fishermen in the river seeing a craft above high power lines, which run up through that mountain. I mean, right right through the farm and up the mountain, up the up the Northumberland Ridge. Uh, they saw what they said or they described as a man uh, or a a human-looking individual being pulled up into a light wearing his shorts, okay? Now, the second part of that story was that the farmer who was out in the field saw the same thing. We talked to the farmer. He never said anything like that. He said... He said, I know that my neighbor was missing and everybody's looking for him. I said, he said, even we were looking for him, but we didn't find him. But he said, I don't know what you're talking about with stuff over the power line. And of course, there was no fisherman ever found or questioned by us or the police or anybody else. That's interesting. So that that was Davenport report is a mirror image of the uh, newspaper reporter from the uh, newspaper that published the original things. So what Newfork was doing was they were taking that reporter's information and, you know, starting with a, making like a background chronology. And I, I you know, nothing, nothing in that report uh, that we found even when it was given to uh, on the Jeff Rents radio program, um, what they did talk about the coroner, Point Township police chief, all this stuff, never happened. Wow. It, just, it just never happened. I mean, they said it was being investigated as an unexplained death. No, it was an explained death. They said uh, that uh, it was cocaine overdose. But in their report, and I'm going to quote here. If the death of Mr. Cease is being investigated as an unexplained death and not as a homicide, why are the local authorities involved in the investigation refusing to comment on the case? In fact, 
the death was the result of a snake bite, a bee sting, diabetic coma, or exposure. I have no idea what that has to do with anything. He was not bitten by a snake. He surely wasn't killed by a bee sting. He had, he wasn't, had diabetes. And, uh, you know, the only thing they put in here, instead of saying that the victim's remains were in the advanced stages of decomposition, they say his body was so decayed and disfigured that the family could not have had an open casket. It just, they put in here there were unconfirmed reports that special agents from the FBI and other federal law enforcement officers, uh, uh, enforcement agencies were on the scene. That's not true. None of that's true. Um, the remains at the time the body was discovered, they put in here that the tracking dogs were, the tracking dogs were very adept at following the scent. Those dogs walked past that body for two, almost two days. And, and aren't we talking people, about about 200 some odd people in the search party that are looking for him? I mean, wasn't that yeah. that's that's just insane to think that they wouldn't have found that body as they're going the back. Temperature, the temperature the temperature currently was 98 degrees. This guy, you probably could have smelled this guy a mile down the road. That's how bad the body was decomposed. Now, the strangest thing is, when we talked to pathologists, we talked to coroners, uh, we showed them copies of the coroner's report and told them that, you know, all this takes place within 36 hours, 34 to 36 hours, they all say the same thing. No way did that happen that way. Right. Because, you know, even walking that mile, a normal pace, just walking that mile from his ATV to his house, it probably would have taken him over an hour and a half to two hours in the shape he was in under that chemical base. So here's a guy who's, if you believe everything that they're saying, he is decomposing as he's walking home. <laughs> right. And instead of, and instead of walking to his house, which is 50 yards from where he's found, he crawls under a tree and dies. But the coroner said he's dead for 36 hours. Right. The so math just doesn't work out there. Where'd right. he go? Right. <laughs> where'd he go? <laughs> right. Um, what What are they trying to hide here? I mean, this is just so strange. Uh, you know, or, or you know, you, you you start to think about this. Or, I mean, how? Why take so long to determine the cause of death? And then. You know, why are they trying so hard, but yet you fo you file FOIA um, requests and uh, yep. they, they, they keep saying the case is still open. Isn't that correct? Yep. They, uh, we, we got one FOIA request sent back to us saying that I spelled his name wrong. Wow. That, yeah, that's, that's pretty petty to deny a FOIA request for that. And it's just bizarre that why say the case is open? They already had determined a cause of death. That's that's just so strange. And and yet it seems like they're talking out of two sides of their mouth. One, they're saying cause of death has been determined. In the other case, they're saying that the case is still open. So it's it's just so so bizarre. Well, the longest time, uh, different researchers out there uh, were saying that. It was still an open case, according to the district attorney in Northumberland County. Well, the only time you would keep an open case on a on a death would be in the state of Pennsylvania, anyway, would be for a murder. Now, like I said, that place is so remote that you could walk up there in the middle of the day, I don't care when, and kill somebody, and nobody would know it. Nobody would care. People were shooting up on that mountain all the time, shooting at snakes and bear and everything else. When we were up there, we ran into two black bear and half a dozen rattlesnakes. So there's a story. We just don't know what that story is. But like I said before, we keep getting little bits and pieces of information that either are sent to us or we find out on our own. And... Slowly but surely, we're putting together 
a couple different scenarios. You know, it just, I, I just, I don't say I get frustrated with it. I just see no purpose in hiding it if it's what they say it is. So if the guy was this cocaine user, why didn't the family know that? Why didn't the local police know that? Why didn't the state police narcotics squad know that? Why didn't all his friends know that? I mean, we're not talking about a little bit of cocaine here. We're talking about a lot of cocaine. Right. So, so the interesting thing is why, if the family don't believe that was the case, you would think that they would be doing everything. And again, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I, I know this was probably a horrible thing for the family to go through, uh, but you would think that they would be following up and trying to clear his name and, and maybe work with investigators like you to try and get the truth out there, but I mean, it, it, that doesn't seem to be the case. Are they just wanting this mm -hmm. to go away? Or We told family members from the very beginning, we, the only reason we were looking at it was we believe that he should have an honest report instead of all of nonsense, like he was abducted by aliens, uh, motorcycle gangs were involved. I mean, there were all kinds of stories floating around. Now, they didn't really seem to care. And like the cocaine in the coveralls, I don't know about you, but if I was my brother and I found cocaine in his pocket while I was looking for his keys and I was going to turn those coveralls over to the police department, I'd bury that dope. Right. Right. You're not going to want to, you know, see your, uh, see your family exactly. member, you know, yeah, their, their reputation trashed over, over a situation when you're already dealing with the loss of a family member. Uh, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And they were, they were really upset. Uh, but we had, we have had a lot of cooperation from people, uh, from his friends. Uh, and what was amazing or kind of strange to us was that the coroner also owns a funeral parlor. Yet when it comes, although he says to, he does all the talking about the funeral, we find out that he was not the funeral parlor that held the funeral. It was another, it was a competitor of his that did the funeral. So everything he's talking about the funeral, unless he was there on the spot and making all the decisions, like it kind of seems like he was, he had nothing to do with it. So, so why do you think there's so many people that are being silenced over this? Who, I mean, is it really the state police that would be, you know, making all these people, you know, clam up and not say a word? Or, I mean, we're talking, it almost seems like there should be, there, there's somebody bigger involved in this, whether it's, um, you know, and dare I say the, the feds, um, you know, a, another agency, you're if you will. You're not talking about the alphabet agencies, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I won't say that, but. But somebody bigger... <laughs> well, at... well, well, I will. It's possible. Sure. <laughs> Anything's possible. Who else could erase every, all the information? Now, I don't know a lot about you. This is for the first time I'm, I'm talking to you. But you're Air Force retired Air Force Reserve officer, correct? That is correct. Okay. So there's a paper trail to you with the Air Force Reserve, correct? Yes. Absolutely. So what if I looked at it tomorrow and it wasn't there anymore? Who could do that? Yeah, and uh, it so doesn't certainly seem like the state police would have the ability to do that, and that's uh, that's the weird thing here. Well, I think I think they would have the ability to take care of like uh, a criminal record, arrest report, that kind of stuff. Maybe it was a snitch, you know, that, that kind of thing they could cover up. But they can't take away your social security number. Your driver's license. He had no driver's license, no hunting. He was an avid sportsman. No hunting license, no fishing license, no archery license, uh, no gun permits, uh, no driver's license, although he was a truck driver. Didn't, uh, couldn't find any marriage license, couldn't find divorce license, couldn't find tax records, any of that stuff. And in my book, from my knowledge, the only people that can do that is the government. Right. And, and then I guess the other I mean, the other question I would ask is, so I think you you said you don't think that the original report of the 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 guys who had called in a well supposedly had called in 
UFO sighting. Uh, is there any chance that um, they really did see something there, and uh, you know they they were later told to 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 be quiet about the case because it seems like everybody else is is being silenced over this for whatever reason. Now that's very now, now that's very possible, but I will say this: historically, we have had reports in that area of UFOs. Historically. The closest one to his house was about, I'm, I'm going to, off the top of my head, I'm going to say it was like four or five years after he died, there was a report of a UFO sighting uh, on the other side of the Montour Ridge, and that was two police officers that saw that, and they made the report, and a truck driver also saw it uh, flying along the river line. So, historically... I have to say, yes, there have been reports, and the latest one was the one that I just mentioned. But, you know, somebody asked me a question one time, could it have been an abduction gone bad? Well, there's no way of, there's no way of proving that. Right. But there are enough strange things in the case that tend to lead you in a number of directions. Um, first of all, the condition of the body, that's the biggest thing. What if he, and then they show up on his own property. So, you know, was the guy someplace else and then brought to that part of the, brought to that scene? Was he dead longer than that 36 hours to be in that condition? Was he murdered? Uh, was he abducted? Um. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you can take that in so many different directions, but then you got to be able to prove it. Right. And that's that's what we need to that's what we need to do. And we're we're on that path, I think. Uh, although we don't get the massive amount of information we used to get when we first started, we do get bits and pieces, and they do fit in not only with uh, friends and family members, but. Um, police and fire and the coroner and, you know, the undertaker and uh, the, the pieces are coming together slowly. But there's one thing I want to say that with the exception of that one person in the family and his mother and father are still living, uh, wife, um, there are two things that just really bug me. One, we can't locate his son. That's number one. Number two, Nobody in that family, with the exception of that one niece, has ever contacted us to see what we got or if we found anything other than, you know, what they know right? or what they perceive to know. That's just bizarre. And, and is, to me, too, I mean, I just, I, to, for the life of me, I can't understand. And again, with all due respect to the family, it just, I don't understand that piece of it. You would think that, you know, the guy's pretty squeaky clean. Um, they've smeared him with this cocaine thing, and it doesn't sound like it was really true cause of death based on, you know, from what I'm hearing. Um, why would they do that? I mean, this guy didn't, wasn't it true that also one of the police officers knew him and said that he had ID'd him? Every, everybody that we talked to about this guy, we, we looked for anything that would give somebody a, a, a bad comment on this guy. Curry, we found nobody. Nobody said a bad word about him. Not one person out of all the people we talked to. Not one. And uh, for family members to... Mm, not question anything that we're doing. Right. It's just bizarre. It is. I mean, it just doesn't add. I mean, just, it's just totally not right. Uh, so this veil of silence, which we poked holes into, which we really want to tear down, but we poked holes in it enough. And we, right now, we, uh, are trying to track down one of the um, EMT uh, workers that has retired and moved down south. 
Yeah, and see, that's the uh, interesting thing. I, I guess what I would, what what I wanted to ask is, you've had some people. I don't know if they've anonymously, and I know there's not some stuff that you can't share because this is an ongoing investigation on your part, and just like law enforcement, there's things that they can't share because it's an ongoing investigation. But have have you had people contact you? I mean, if you can say, and have they given you any? kind of inkling about why they're trying to p potentially cover this thing up about what really happened? We only had one, and that was very early on the investigation. And that individual said that, and we tried to prove this, and we could not prove it, and so until we prove it, it's just, in my, my estimation, hearsay, where he said to us that after the body was removed, that they were all called back to the fire department, and they were told by um, federal agents that this never happened. Now, the FBI, when we contacted them, they didn't even know what the hell we were talking about. <laughs> they had no clue. And the uh, lady says, we don't get involved in missing person cases unless it goes across the state line. Is this a kidnapping or something? I said, no. The guy just got lost in the woods and turned up dead. And she said, that happens all the time. That has nothing to do with the FBI. That's not a federal crime. And she's right. It's not a federal crime. Right. We found no military record for this guy. So now that could be easily erased. I understand that. But we found no military record for this guy. We found um, no voter registration. I mean, everything, the simple things that this guy should have had. Nothing. Uh, when he was found, uh, when his clothing was found, there was no wallet, uh, no keys for the ATV. What happened to the keys to the ATV? Where'd they go? Um, then they were saying that, well, one of his boots was up in a tree. Well, they never found either boot up in a tree or any place else. So what happened to the boots? Right. Like I said, like I said, he was found in his t-shirt, shorts, not, not underwear, shorts, regular, you know, like walking shorts, cut off jeans, shorts, and white socks. That's what that's what it clothed the entire. Now, uh, again, I, you know, I, with respect to you and your team and what you're doing, um, I understand. You know, investigative work. You have to follow the evidence where it takes you. But I can understand how ufologists have grabbed hold of this and said, "Hey, you know, <laughs> we've had we've had weird cases like this in the past, and." You know, with everything not adding up and the potential cover-up of information, I can see how they have just grabbed a hold of this. And, uh, you know... Well, yeah, but see, that's a simple way of doing it. I mean... Sure, sure, it is. If you know nothing about the case, you've talked to nobody, you have no uh, records, you have no emails, you have no letters, you have no evidence at all, it would be simple to just walk out at, to the public and say, look... This guy was abducted by a UFO that was seen above a power line, and it went bad, and he died in the process. And that's where they placed him. They brought him back while everybody's walking around looking for him. In broad daylight, they bring him back and shove him under a tree. Right, and that that, that you would think somebody would have saw something exactly. I, but, but like I said, I, I, I can see how they would grab a hold of this and, and, and go that, that direction. But Yeah. But well, yeah, and look, if, you, if you're not going to investigate anything, but you want to get something out there, whether it's for fortune and glory or your 15 minutes of fame or whatever they look for, that's the way to do it. You know, just run with, throw it out there. And if it sticks, it sticks. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Absolutely. Conspiracy um, theories, uh, but, they, they sell. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, hey, 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 but, you know, I find that a lot in the paranormal. You'll have some researchers in the paranormal that will go to great lengths and expense out of their own pockets to prove or disprove something. I admire those folks. Uh, we try to do the same thing. We take no donations. We don't take any, no promises, anything like that. Everything comes out of our pocket. You know, we, we do it ourselves. We have a, we have our own mobile units. Uh, we have, we have uh, our own researchers here, and we have researchers in England. We have researchers in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, so we have, uh, although we were primarily started as a UFO group, that was my background, and then, you know, 
cryptozoology came into play and paranormal came into play. So it's pretty much now we do soup the nuts. But there are certain things when you're developing uh, evidence, especially paranormal evidence, that talk is cheap. But, you know, I, I, I heard one guy say that he has a 15, or I'm, I'm sorry, 25 page report on the autopsy. The autopsy is only 10 pages. So I have no idea what report he has, but I have I have the certified copy from the coroner's office in my hand right now, dated May seventeenth, twenty thirteen. So you've you've uh, you've obviously investigated a lot of other cases, whether they be abduction and and I think you've done some human mutilation cases. Is this the weirdest? Yes. Is this the weirdest you've investigated? This is. Yeah, I, I'm going to say yes, because even with the, uh, the human mutilation cases, I could find all the information. I talked to lawyers uh, that handled people that were uh, uh, thought to do the mutilation. I talked to farmers. I talked to other investigators across the country and overseas. I mean, everybody was willing to talk, share pictures, information, uh, reports from necropsies and everything. This case... This is like opening a closet, looking for your coat, and your coat hasn't been in that closet for 20 years. Right. <laughs> there's, you know, and then you open another door, and there's the sleeve of the coat laying on the floor. You know what I mean? You find a little piece here and a little piece there. I, to me, uh, it's the strangest case that I've ever worked on. But it's one of these cases where when we went at it, we went at it tooth and nail. I mean, everybody got involved. We were all over the place, getting everything we could, talking to everybody we could. And then, you know, we backed off. We just backed off a little bit. And we got some more stuff. Then we backed off some more. And we got some more stuff. Now we backed off again. And now again, after it seems to be like when we back, when we're out there really hitting it hard, you know, we'll get what we need or close to what we need. But it seems like when we back off and don't say anything about it and don't do anything with it or anything like that for a few months, there's like, we always get somebody to like, I'm going to send you an email. I, I, I just thought of this, you know, this just came to my mind about the Tazi's case. And then we get somebody who went to school. With him. We couldn't find a picture of the guy. Right? right. We had to go to the library up in Northumberland County. And we found the yearbook, which had a picture when he was probably 17. And I put out on my website one time, I said, you know, yeah, we found a picture of 17. I published it. And about five months later, I get a picture of the guy fishing with two of his buddies at approximately a year before he died. So now I know exactly what he looks like. But where's his son? We can't find him. He doesn't exist. Wow. Then we find out that the police were called to the house the night before for a row between the son and the father. Can't get the incident report. Police don't know what the, what, know, know what we're talking about, but we have three people tell us that. Wow. It's, you know, uh, Curry, it'll all work out in the wash. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I could have found a better way to say that. But <laughs> eventually, somebody's going to say something. Right. I mean, it, it only makes uh, sense, you know. I mean, if they've been silenced now, it seems like in other weird cases, you know, people eventually start coming out and talking. Eventually, their conscience gets the best of them, and, uh, you know, maybe it's when they're in their 80s or 90s, and, you know, <laughs> hopefully it doesn't take that yeah, long. To... No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, somebody will be sitting there thinking about it, and they'll go like, ah, I wonder if those guys are still looking at this, you know, and they'll send something. Or we get a genealogist that says, hey, guess what I found? You know, I found this record or that record, and um, it's... Uh, it's something that we work on religiously. We've not let it go. We've not shelved it. All that information is on a shelf in my library right next to where I sit. And I look at it constantly and keep myself refreshed on the cases. But um, it, it's, it's weird. It's bizarre. It's strange uh, reactions that we've gotten from police, fire departments, friends, neighbors, um, agencies that we've tried to deal with and have dealt with, uh, police departments, uh, but like the trooper that sent the, the trooper that sent that information a little while ago and gave us some information on the case. 
I mean, I, his name never came up in anything. But he was a patrol sergeant, but two of his men did. So now the one guy don't want to get involved, but the other guy talked freely. Yeah, that's... So we sent our investigator from Florida up to South Carolina and met with him and got all the information face-to-face -face on paper. The other thing that kind of... That's does... what you... No, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's what you got to do. Right. No, it's what you got to do. It's the way you got to do it. I mean, I mean, I can sit here and say, well, I got the uh, toxicology report and I got the uh, coroner's report, but if I didn't have them and you said to me, well, can I see them? I'd have to start making up excuses where they are, but they're right here in my hand. Right. Signed, sealed, delivered. Now, uh, as per your request, and here's the cover letter, as per your request, encloses a true and correct copy of the autopsy and toxicology reports from Mr. Todd Cease. Sincerely, James F. Kelly, coroner, Northumberland County Coroner's Office. With a page missing, correct? <laughs> yep. So, uh... The other thing I would, I mean, have you ever had anybody, any weird phone calls, emails that you would say may have been threatening that would say, hey, give it up, um, you know? No. Mm -hmm. no, no, I haven't. Yeah. I mean, I've been involved in some really weird stuff, and I've never gotten any of those calls. Interesting. I always said, look, if you find me dead on a jogging trail, it's a murder. Right, right. Don't believe them. Now you it you're is, never gonna find my you're never gonna find my body on a jogging trail. <laughs> now, um, is Lon Strickler still involved in the case with you? Because I know he was for a while. Oh, yeah. He yeah. was working with you. Yeah, Lon. Uh, uh, that's as a matter of fact. That's I mean I knew of Lon years ago, but I never worked with him. And I did a uh, uh, a conference. I believe it was a conference, and I guess he listened to it and he got a hold of me and um. He had some information, uh, although at the at that point we had already gotten that information, and he asked if you know we could share information on. It. I said, yeah, I don't have a problem with that because he's a, you know he's well respected. He's a good guy. And um, uh, about three years ago, um, he started his own team uh, similar to mine, but his is nailed down to five guys, and it's the Phantoms and Monsters Forty and Research Team. And he asked me if I would join that team to help him out. I said, sure, no problem. So I've worked with him on a lot of cases. As a matter of fact, I'm working on one with him now in Oklahoma on a uh, kind of a nasty Bigfoot case. But um, I have researchers in Oklahoma. I have 11 branches across the states. And my researchers in Oklahoma are going to take the case and go out and look. Because, look, one of the things that really helps a lot is when you develop a working system where like I surely am not going to jump in the van and head to Oklahoma on a Bigfoot case but I have people who live in Oklahoma about 40 miles from this guy who can contact and get all the information and go to the scene it is it, it everybody in our group and in the Fortean team are all long time researchers I'm at this 30 years Lon's been at it longer than I have, um, and there's others out there that have been at it longer than I have, and I'm like I said, I'm in a 30 years. But um, it really is pretty neat when you can get a report, and you can do the investigation. So say it's right here in Pennsylvania, and I did the investigation, but there's something wrong about it that I can send out emails or make phone calls to other members and throw stuff up and say, well, what do you think? Or is this possible? Or did you ever hear of anything like this? And I can get an answer. Right. And in most groups, it doesn't work that way. I mean, you know, you push too many buttons and all of a sudden everybody's PO'd and, you know, they want your head hanging off the wall. Right. And I, I, you know, I, I've had researchers call it, you know, I've talked to them one time. Right. In all these years, I talked to them one time. Then I'll meet them at a conference and I'll go like, hey, thanks for sharing that information. I didn't even remember who they were. Right. Um, I, I, you know, I've spoken at conferences in Kansas, Florida, New York, I mean, all over the place. And I find that most researchers are, they do their due diligence. They, they are, they're smart. Uh, they're not out to make a name for themselves. 
you're not going to see him running through the woods chasing Bigfoot with a pork chop. <laughs> um, you have, um, um, you know, uh, a lot of good researchers. Um, you've had a couple on your show, uh, Stan Gordon. Yes. I've done some work for him. Um, he's given me a lot of information. Mark Nesbitt down in Gettysburg. So, I mean, there's, there's people out there that have been around a long time and, um, you know, they're not a joke. And they're not, you know, they're not making, um, uh, comic books or, <laughs> or doing, uh, wild stuff that you see on TV that you're going like, did that guy just jump out of a helicopter without a parachute? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I found that when you surround yourself with like-minded people, like-minded researchers and knowledgeable people that have been doing a long time, you're more apt to get the answer you're looking for. Right. And, um, I mean, like I said, I've shared information with people that I never met in my life. Don't live anywhere near Pennsylvania, but they couldn't get the information anyplace else. And they called and said, did you ever run into anything like this? Or could you tell me where I could find this piece of equipment or where I could get this chemical? Or how would you uh, test for blood stains, you know, in a cave? And you know, I, I get some of the weirdest questions in the world, but I'll always give them an answer. If I don't know. I just tell them I don't know. If I do know, I'll get back to them right away. Right. Now, going back to the uh, the, the case, one other thing I wanted to ask about, because that, this is the other strange part of it that doesn't make sense to me. So, uh, was the ATV parked up on the top of the ridge and then, you know, just left there? And, and was it in working condition when they, when they, when they found the ATV? Because it just doesn't well, make sense yeah. that he would leave yeah, it there. Yeah, the ATV was fine. They just didn't find the keys for it. Right. Uh, and it was found a mile away by the sun. The sun found it. Okay. There was no signs of any struggle. The ATV wasn't all smashed up or anything like that. It was just sitting there, no keys. Now, was it on and the top gas. of the ridge? Was it was it up on the top of the ridge? Because that would make sense if he's spotting deer, that he would be up on the ridge where he's looking out well, on the high ground. Uh, let me let me let me explain the ridge a little bit. The ridge, like if you. You're familiar, you're familiar with the high tension power lines that go through properties, right? You know, they cut all the trees and make a path and all these towers go up through. Right, and I've seen the pictures, the overhead imagery okay. from the That's side. The, it's not a very high incline. It's not a steep incline. It's uh, approximately six square miles. That ridge is approximately six square miles. When you walk up that, when you're walking uh, up the trail, uh, a side of the home, uh, where the body was found and going up that trail and heading into the heavily wooded area. Uh, and it's a very rock, like I said, very rocky. It's just unbelievable terrain. Um, you hit some flat spots and then you might hit a level little hill. And I mean, small hill, not big, not big, deep incline. And then it'll flatten out again. And that's kind of the way it is all the way up to the top. From what we gather from the information we got, that ATV was one mile north of the home, which would have put it in a slightly inclined area, which turned into a flat area, which went back into a even lesser inclined area, and then a flat area. So we're assuming from where we started at the house and going one mile in that direction that, okay, we, we're perfectly healthy, right? right? And it took us 40 minutes 42 minutes, I believe it was, to walk from there to that area. Now, in the condition that body was, and the condition with all that drug in him, all that degraded cocaine in him, I can't imagine this guy even walked 10 feet away from that ATV before he fell over. Right. Wow. I mean, the one doctor we talked to that we showed the autopsy report to said a hardcore drug user could not ingest that much cocaine, let alone not show any signs in the body of cocaine use. Right. Yeah. Wow. Well, what a what a bizarre and 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 fascinating case as well. But it's 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 just truly sad though that you know this guy seems to be drug across the mud over this, and it just. It, it doesn't seem to make sense why they would do that. Um, and that's just the strange. Well, it's either it's either something really simple 
or it's something that is really just bizarre. You know, when I say that, I mean like government interference or the possibility of uh, some unknown force. But the, the way they simplify it as having, well, it was hot out, so that's the way the body got. No, that's not the way the body gets. If you uh, look up on the website, the, the Body Farm, which is located, I believe, in Tennessee, uh, where they put bodies out and they, for students and med medical people to see how the bodies decompose over time. I mean, this guy was in the advanced stages of decomposition. That does not happen in that amount of time. The uh, maggots, larva, they take three to four days to develop. This right. guy was covered in them. Wow. So, which leads to one to ask, well, was the body there ever at all, or was the body someplace else? Right. But but with so many people being there involved in that search, you'd think it would be hard to... Sure, sure it sure would explain why a lot of people went deaf, right? Right. Yeah, it is. It's it is. It's just bizarre with that many people involved in the search party and all that. Wow. Well, what a fascinating but yet scary... Um, case you know i kind of i hearken back to david polides and some of the cases he's investigated and where people sure. have just strangely disappeared and there's there's no explanation for it i mean it there's there's yeah. no blood trail there's no uh you know and it just you just scratch your head and go how is this happening you know i mean it's just so bizarre oh yeah i you know david polides work and you got uh, uh human mutilations they're all over the world they're just not here in the United States. They're everywhere. Some of the biggest mutilations have taken place in England. You have people turn up missing in Australia. Uh, I've been working with an Australian researcher now for about three years trying to figure out uh, how a child disappeared in broad daylight with his mother standing at the window. They never found that kid. Well, it's, it, it certainly is. There's so many mysteries out there in terms of uh, how these sorts of things happen. And uh, maybe we'll never know in this case. Do you think that's possible? We'll just never really get down to the truth? Well, that's possible, but we're going to keep trying. That's, we're not going to give it up. Right. And uh, you I know, mean, however it, turn, however it turns out, it's going to turn out. Right. Well, uh, Butch, my hat's off to you for all the research you've done on this and your uh, your willingness to stay the course with this investigation because uh, I, I probably would have got frustrated with <laughs> years ago and said, you know, there's just not enough to go on and, uh, you know, case, uh, well, I don't know about case closed, but um, but so, so you know, I, uh, like I said, my hat's off to you and your team and the folks you've worked with that you guys have continued pursuing this because... Uh, you know, a lot of people would have just said, you know, hey, I just, <laughs> there's nothing and there's not enough to go on and we're just going to, you know, give up on it. So um, amazing that you guys are still, you know, going the course and, and trying to get the answer. So, so, uh, well, need, we, we need that answer that we need, uh, not only just for us, but for Todd himself. Absolutely. Yeah. And I it, mean, it just right does... now I'm, I'm looking at a guy that's been, in my estimation, maligned as a drug user and we can't pull up any information that he ever used a drug in his life. Right. And it just doesn't, so, doesn't seem fair to him that, uh, you know, that, that, right. that, that, uh, that's the, the legacy there that has been left over this case. So, well, um, Butch, I, you know, I, I really do appreciate you joining me and talking with me about this case. And, uh, you know, I'm going to follow it and, uh, you know, see what, what, what comes of it down the road. And um, hopefully you guys get some better leads and some people will come out of the woodworks and talk uh, down the road as, as, as time goes by. Uh, where can people find more information uh, about the work you're doing and, uh, and, and find out uh, more about this case? Oh, they go to our website at uh, uforcop.com. Uh, on Facebook, UFO Research Center Pennsylvania. Under my name on Facebook, Butch Wachowski. Under, my na under U4COP, UFOCOP, uh, UFO. UFORCOP, 
that's also a Facebook page. Um, if they need to contact me, they can go to the website at uh, uforkop.com or uforesearchcenter.com, either one. They'll take you there. Go to the terrestrial contact part of the of the site, and they can send me a uh, direct email. Right comes right to my computer, one of my computers, and um, I usually answer everything within a few hours. Great. Well, hey, Butch, thank you so much for spending the time with me. I'm glad we were finally able to to get together to talk this. Um, so so interesting. And again, like I said, I'll, I'll continue to follow it. And uh, maybe down the road, if there's new leads or new information, uh, maybe you'll come on and talk with me again. Oh, absolutely. No problem there. Great. Well, hey, hey, Butch, you have a great rest of the night and, uh, and uh, best of luck to you in your efforts down the road here. And thank you. It's been a pleasure to be on. Yeah, been been a pleasure talking with you. Okay, so that about do it for tonight's show. And once again, a big thanks to Butch for joining me on the show to share with me where him and his research team are at on this uh, bizarre Todd C's case. I really hope they're able to get to the bottom of this and get the truth out there, at least for the sake of Mr. Todd C's. And uh, I mentioned this before earlier, uh, I'm running the uh, promotion for anybody who's willing to head over to iTunes and just do a quick review of the show. And uh, you can send me an email at uh, passion, the number four, the paranormal at gmail.com. Or you can message me on the Facebook page and let me know you've done that review. If they're the first to do so, I'll be starting this on uh, 1 January and I'll be running this promotion through 15 January. So you've got a couple of weeks. If you can do the review by then, you're first to do so. I'll kindly mail out that $25 Amazon gift card. Okay, so I think I mentioned this before. I'm going to now be doing two shows a month. So I'm going to be putting out an episode on the 1st and the 15th of every month. A lot of great shows on the horizon. I've got uh, William Sheehan joining me next month. And uh, William is a Bigfoot author. He's written, I think he's got six volumes out there now on his Bigfoot series called Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sighting is in Encounters. That's going to be a great show. Please don't miss that. Uh, once again, thank you for tuning in and supporting the show. And uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Hope you had a great Christmas and Happy New Year. And uh, once again, really looking forward to next month and uh, 2019. There's going to be some great shows in 2019. So once again, thank you for tuning in and Happy New Year. <laughs>